Matthew 7. Let me read to you verses 21 down to 23. 21 to verse 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. We're continuing our series on the Sermon on the Mount, and this morning we're looking at the topic of self-deception. Self-deception is the most insidious deception of all. The easiest person to deceive is, one own, is one's own self. George Orville was right when he said the only Inf only thing infinite in our capacity is for self-deception. Nothing is more painful than absolute truth. Recently read an article about a school teacher who invested all of her life savings and lost it all when she invested into a Ponzi scheme, a fly-by-night business scheme, and after her dreams were shattered and her investments were gone, she went to the Better Business Bureau to report this organization and the official asked her, why didn't you come to us first before you put all of your money into this organization? And the lady replied, I didn't come to you because I was afraid that you would tell me not to put my money into them. The 16th century philosopher Francis Bacon sums it up well when he says, man prefers to believe what he prefers to be true. We want to believe whatever makes us feel better about ourselves, even if it's a lie. One Hollywood filmmaker excused the hypocrisy of Hollywood celebrities with these words. He said, narcissism and self-deception are survival mechanisms without which many of us might jump off a bridge. But guys, self-deception is not just a harmless coping mechanism. Dr. Scott Peck is a renowned counselor, and he's written a chillingly compelling book called The People of the Lie. Dr. Peck draws from his years of counseling to delve into the lies that respectable people tell to convince themselves that they actually are okay, that they're really nice people, even while they do the most evil things imaginable. And in his book, he has a section called The Case of Bobby and His Parents. Bobby was a 15-year-old that was sent to, by the courts to see Dr. Peck because his grades in school were dropping. He was depressed after crashing a car that he had stolen. And after several sessions with Bobby, Dr. Peck was alarmed by what he heard. He learned that Bobby's older brother, Stuart, had committed suicide in June of the prior year by shooting himself with a, in the head with a 22 caliber rifle. Stewart's suicide was the cause of Bobby's anger and depression. But what Dr. Peck learned next was bizarre. At Christmas, Bobby's parents gave him a 22 caliber rifle. And Dr. Peck asked Bobby, isn't that the same kind of rifle that your brother used to shoot himself? And Bobby replied softly, it's the exact rifle that my brother used to shoot himself. Dr. Peck was stunned. Bobby's parents were basically telling him to commit suicide. So Dr. Peck called his parents into the office, and they seemed to be quite normal, middle-class, hard-working, church-going people. And the therapist confronted them about their bizarre Christmas gift. Don't you see that giving Bobby a gun is like telling him that, he's about to, that he should go and kill himself? And the parents were stunned and actually offended. They couldn't see their gift's connection to their older son's suicide, and they couldn't see the consequences of it for Bobby. And in his work, in his writing, Dr. Peck began to formulate a thesis that the teenager was in the clutches of evil powers. Evil resided in Bobby's mom and dad. They were people who simply could not tell the truth about themselves or even to themselves. The thesis of the book, People of the Lies, is that self-deception is the very definition of evil. Evil people deceive themselves and others 
by building upon layer upon layer of self-deception around them. They even convince themselves that what they are doing is really good. Hitler was convinced that he was doing the world a favor by eliminating Jews. The Jewish rabbi, the Jewish rabbi Saul of Tarsus was convinced that he was obeying God by killing Christians. And Dr. Peck makes a bold conclusion in his book. He says, evil people are not the same as sinful people. It's not their sins in themselves that distinguish evil people from sinful people. It's the lie about the sin that makes them so evil. Sinful people recognize that they are sinful. Evil people convince themselves that they're not. They have so deceived themselves that they become quite an expert at deceiving others. St. Paul would say that evildoers are, in the end times, are ones who deceive others and are easily deceived themselves. In our text this morning on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus speaks of evildoers who have convinced themselves that they deserve entrance into heaven. They stand before King Jesus who now sits on the judgment seat of heaven. If you heard the text that I read, you'll notice one thing in that text. They talk about all the things that they do, but in that text they never share or they never admit that they are sinners. They never admit their sinfulness and their need for a Savior. But they plead their case before Jesus on the basis of their goodness. Look at what I have done. Look at all I've done for you. Look at all the people I've told you about. But Jesus exposes their fraud. And guys, this text that we're looking at this morning is probably one of the most chilling passages in the entire Bible. And if we soften it with lies today, if we try to not take it seriously, the only result is that it will lead to eternal peril. And so we need to listen to these words of Jesus and we need to hear it and we need to apply it to our lives with absolute seriousness this morning. And there's a principle that I want you to take away this morning with, and that's that the creativity of self-deception is inexhaustible. Self-deception, it is very creative. You will find that it will make all sorts of excuses for why you do what you do. Jesus in verse 22 of our text says, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not? And Jesus will look at them and say, No, you didn't. And it's sadly the verse says many. It doesn't say, Man, eh, there's just a handful of people that will come and say, Did we not do this in your name? And Jesus will say, No, you didn't. It says many will. Back in verse 14, which we looked at a few weeks ago, Jesus says, but small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life, but only a few will find it. So it would be less frightening and less chilling for us if the text said that only a few were deceived when they stood before the judgment throne of God. It would be less frightening for us if it said many walked the straight and narrow path that led to Jesus, but Jesus says quite the opposite. The creativity of self-deception even among professing Christians, is infinite. It's inexhaustible. Derek Landry is an author of a book called The Death Bringer. And in this book, there's a conversation that goes like this. He says, the fact is that we have no way of knowing if the person who we think we are is who we are at the core of our being. Are you a decent girl that someday becomes an evil monster? Or... Are you an evil monster that someday happens to be a decent girl? Wouldn't I know which one I was? The question is asked back to him. He says, good God, no. The lies that we tell other people are nothing compared to the lies that we tell ourselves. See, nothing is easier than self-deceit. Nothing is easier than lying to ourselves to say that, hey, we're okay. For what a man wishes that also he believes to be true. See, we can lie to ourselves and get away with it, and we can lie to other people and get away with it, but the fact of the matter is, all of us will stand before the judgment seat of God one day, and we're not going to be able to get away with our lies. Because everything will be exposed at that day. And Jesus doesn't preach these words in Matthew 7 to discourage us. He actually wants to save us from ourselves. He wants to rescue us from our own self-deception. And he's asking for us to turn from self-deception 
to be people of reflection, to be people that examine their hearts consistently. Socrates was famous for saying, an unexamined life is a life not worth living. See, it's necessary for us to go away, to isolate ourselves, to sit in isolations and ask the questions of, who am I? Where have I been? What am I doing? Where am I going? What are, what's my motivation? See, when you go away to reflect, and you have to do that if you're a follower of Jesus, there are some things that Jesus wants you to be watchful of. And our text gives us three things that need, we need to be watchful of where self-deception can deceive us. And here's the first thing. first thing is that Jesus teaches us to watch out for self-deception in an orthodox confession. Self-deception in an orthodox confession. Jesus says in verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he uses the same phrase in verse 22, not everyone, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, two times the word Lord is repeated twice. See, that's the Hebrew poetical way of saying, expressing urgency or passion or surprise. This is a desperation cry. It's a condemned person pleading his case. It's a convicted person saying, I don't want to die. The person is pleading with Jesus, who has now been crucified, resurrected, and ascended to glory. This is the King of kings and the Lord of lords sitting on the judgment seat. This is the final judgment when all accounts are settled. The Greek word for Lord there is the word kairi. But kairi was used among the Hebrew people in many other ways. The Jewish people would call their rabbi kairi. But this is not the Greek kairi that a Jewish person would use to describe his rabbi. This is not the kairi that a Christian would have used in that day to describe a pastor or a priest. And this is not the kairi that a that um, indicates lordship that a commoner would call a nobleman. This is far more awesome. The Greek translation of the Old Testament used for the word Kyrie is the word Yahweh or Jehovah. This person recognizes that Jesus is God. This person recognizes that Jesus is part of the Trinity. This person recognizes that Jesus is the Savior of the world. This person recognizes that Jesus is the creator of the universe. He knows who Jesus is. This is about as unorthodox of a confession as you can make. He knows the truth about Jesus. Not only is it an orthodox confession, it's an emotional confession. This is not like someone reciting a creed and just saying, I know Jesus is the maker of heaven and earth, and it's just dry bones um, that stifle a yawn. That's not the type of confession that he's making. There's a sense of urgency. There's a sense of plea here. My Lord, Lord, my sweet Jesus, my God. There's an emotion involved here. Wait a minute. Orthodoxy is important. Knowing your theology is important. And when you understand proper theology, it leads to passion. You become passionate about your faith. But the truth is, both of those can be faked. Both of those, you can say what you want to say and deceive others. The half-brother of Jesus, James, in James chapter 2 says, you say there's one God? Good. But even the demons believe and shudder. The demons make the most orthodox confessions of all. Demons in Mark 1 cry out to Jesus, O Holy One of God. That's an orthodox, sound, theological statement right there. In Mark 5, another time they scream, they say, Son of the Most High God. When no one else knew that Jesus was from God, the demons were proclaiming truth about Jesus. James says they shudder when they think of think of God. They have a visceral, gut-wrenching response, which is probably more than most Christians have when God comes to our mind. And every time Jesus confronts them in Scripture, they scream, they shriek, they panic, they grovel, they flee in panic. 
Listen, if an emotional and orthodox confession was enough, demons would be welcomed into heaven. Just because you know your theology and just because you're passionate about your theology, just because you're passionate about Jesus, qualifies you to become a demon. That's about it. Just because you know truth about Jesus doesn't mean that when you stand before Jesus, he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Just because you're passionate about the things of God or the things of church doesn't mean that when you stand before Jesus, he's going to say, come on in. There's a second thing that Jesus warns about in our text. It says, watch out for self-deception in speaking the gospel. In speaking the gospel. Lord, Lord doesn't work. And so the truth sinks in for these guys. And Jesus judges by a completely different standard than we expected him to judge. And now the self-deceived go on in verse 22 and say, Did we not prophesy in your name? The word prophesy is a word that literally means to speak on behalf of someone else. So what they're saying is, Lord, Lord, did we not speak for you? Did we not hear your voice and then communicate it to the people? Did we not speak in your name? Everything that we said was for you and from you. Hold on a minute. These are the people that Jesus spoke about in verse 15. False prophets who come in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ferocious wolves. Let this sink in for you. Let this be an aha moment for you this morning. The thing that ought to shake you to your core when you read this. These ferocious wolves never knew that they were ferocious wolves. They never for a single moment thought they were false prophets. They never had seen themselves as ferocious wolves. When they said, thus saith the Lord, they were sure that they were speaking for Jesus, listen, that ought to shake you because Jesus is shivering the timbers of every pastor, every priest, every rabbi, every televangelist, every Sunday school teacher, every elder, every deacon, every church lady, every bishop, every cardinal, every pope, and every mom and dad that tucks their kids in bed at night and says a prayer over them or reads to them a Bible story. He's saying, just because you said stuff in my name doesn't mean that I'm going to welcome you in. You ask, how can a false prophet prophesy truth? And the Bible is full of examples. In the Old Testament, in the book of Numbers, the Israelites were close to entering the Promised Land. And the Moabite, a foreign army, was scared stiff of the Israelites. They heard about all the exploits that their God had done for them. And a crafty Moabite warlord by the name of Balak knew of a local occult practitioner by the name of Balaam who could curse people. Whenever Balaam put a voodoo hex on people, the curses came to fruition. The curses came true. So he hired this professional cursor to go down and curse the Israelites. Can you imagine that as your job? You're a professional cursor. Um, But Numbers 23 says that Balaam went off to do his black magic. And all of a sudden, God put a word in Balaam's mouth. And he actually began to bless the nation of Israel. Balaam wasn't saved. He wasn't a follower of Jesus, but he prophesied in God's name. Even his donkey began to talk and proclaim the words of Jesus. I don't know if the donkey was saved or not, but I'm going to assume no. right? But, and if God can use a donkey, he can speak through anyone. You, me, anyone. In the New Testament, the high priest Caiaphas was the man that orchestrated the crucifixion of Jesus. But even as he signed the death warrant, the book of John says that he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation and gather together the children of God who were scattered abroad. This was the man who murdered or orchestrated the plan to murder Jesus. Demons prophesied truth. 
the witch of Endor in the Old Testament prophesied to King Saul exactly how he would die. Do I need to continue? Are you convinced yet that just because you speak gospel truth about Jesus, that isn't enough to prove the case? Paul understood the danger of self-deception when it comes to Christian ministry. In 1 Corinthians, he says it this way. He said, I discipline my body and put it into subjection, lest what I have preached to others, I myself might become disqualified. Man, my prayer is that we would all be so careful with our lives. Just because you know truths and confessions of your faith, just because you know gospel truth, that isn't enough. So Jesus gives us a third warning. And he says, be watchful of self-deception of impressive religion. The defendants see their case crumbling before them. Now it's time for a last-ditch effort. Exhibit the C. Did we not? Didn't we drive out demons in your name, Jesus? Didn't we, in your name, perform miracles, Jesus? Is it possible to wield great spiritual power and do impressive religious feats and still be lost? And the answer our text says is, yes, it is. The disciple of Jesus, Judas, was a liar and a cheat right from the beginning. Jesus actually calls him a son from hell. But in Matthew 10, the Bible says that Jesus sent out his 12 disciples to, and gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and heal all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of diseases. Judas was among the 12. He cast out demons. He did supernatural miracles. God even empowered him to do his work. See, God sometimes empowers the unsaved for his glory. Satan also performs counterfeit miracles. Jesus warns that in the end times, false prophets will perform spectacular signs and wonders that even to the effect, if it was possible, that even the elect would, be, would fall away. Do you remember the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 13? He says these words, he says, If I have the gift of prophecy, and I can fathom all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have the faith to move mountains, but I have not love, then I'm nothing. Imagine that all kinds of wisdom, all kinds of knowledge, and that kind of faith to move mountains. But all that doesn't make us anything at all. And he continues, he says, if I give all that I possess to the poor, and I give my body over to the flames, but if I have not love, I'm nothing. Imagine giving yourself over to the poor, like Mother Teresa. That's impressive enough. But then imagine going a step further and saying, you're going the ultimate step of giving your life, your body to the flames of martyrdom for your faith. But Paul says, if that isn't motivated by your love for Jesus, it means nothing. It means nothing. The defendants rest their case. They have nothing else to say. And heaven holds its breath in hushed anticipation. And all of a sudden you see Jesus getting up off of his throne and walking down the steps and he now seats, sits himself in, on the seat and now he's going to plead his case. He is now sitting on the witness stand and he has a point that will change everything. And that leads to our fourth point, that only two realities will ultimately matter. He says in verse 23, then I will tell them plainly. The Greek is a combination of two words. It's a legal, legal term in the ancient courts of the Mediterranean world. It means to give a confession or a testimony before a judge or a jury. He's saying, in effect, you've stated your case. You've offered your defense. Now it's my turn. You've made your confession. Now I'm going to make mine. 
I'm coming down from the judge's bench, and I'm going to become the star witness for the prosecution. Guys, the defendants gave three impressive arguments of why Jesus should accept them. They know their theology. They know who Jesus is. They know the gospel truth, and they were proclaiming the gospel truth. And they were, had a very impressive religious pedigree. And now Jesus counters with only two things. He says two things to counter their argument. Here's, here's what they are. Number one, he says an intimate relationship with the Father. An intimate relationship with the Father. Verse 23 says, I never knew you. I never knew you. Let me pause there for one really quick second. It says, it says I never knew you. It doesn't say, I once knew you and then somehow you chose to fall away. So for those who argue the idea that somehow you can slip and lose your salvation, that's not what Jesus is teaching here. He says, I never knew you. I never knew you. The second thing you need to understand when he says that, he doesn't just mean an intellectual knowledge. Jesus knows all of us by name. Surely the demons knew who Jesus is in an intellectual sense. They know him better than we do because they served before Jesus, before God kicked them out of heaven. Billions of people across this globe know the name of Jesus. The Archbishop of Uganda was once asked if one of his leading bishops was a Christian. And he angrily said, of course he's a Christian. He's not a Muslim. He's not a Jew. He believes in the Trinity and he holds to the great confessions of the Christian faith. And then he paused and with a twinkling in his eye, he said, now if you ask me if he's a saved Christian, that's quite another thing. Jesus is not talking about intellectual knowledge here. But he's speaking of that word know in the way that the Bible speaks of marriage. Adam knew Eve and bore him a son. So you might know that Anne and I are married. You might see us holding hands after service or speaking lovingly to each other. You might even know that we've been married for 12 years. But only Anne and I know if we have a dynamic and intimate love relationship with each other. Only in our private places where you guys do not see is the truth revealed. The same it is with Jesus. Just because you sing a song in church proves nothing. Just because you show up here week in and week out proves nothing. Just because you give of your tithes proves nothing. Even if you raise your hands in worship, proves nothing. Doing religious work and speaking gospel truth and even getting ordained or graduating from seminary means nothing. Do you know him as your savior? Are you intimate with him? Does he know you as a loving husband knows his bride in the private places of life? If you're honest, only you know the truth to that answer, to that question. Only you know it. Jesus says, I never knew you to these people that knew theological truth. They knew the gospel. They were able to share the gospel. And they did signs and wonders in the name of Jesus. But Jesus says, I never knew you. Do you know him? Are you intimate with him? Is he the desire of your heart? Is he the desire of your life? The second thing Jesus says is a lifestyle submission to his lordship. A lifestyle submission to his lordship. Jesus says one other thing in this text, and he repeats it twice for emphasis. Verse 21, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father. And in verse 23, he says, Away from me, you evildoer. 
Remember the words of Scott Peck? Evil is self-deception. See, every one of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. The reborn sinner, the transformed sinner knows that. And he repents. And he cries out for the righteousness of Jesus. He pleads for the blood of Jesus to wash away his sins. She clings to the cross as her only hope. But more than clinging to the cross, reborn Christians take up that cross. More than coming to Jesus as their Savior, they submit to him as their Lord. And you'll never be perfect on this side of glory, but they give everything they have to honor and love and follow their Father in heaven. The Greek word for evildoer is two verbs that are in the present active tense. It speaks of a person who continues to do the same sins, never changes, never repents, never grows, and never figures out the truth. It speaks of a lifestyle of sin. Jesus is saying, I don't only want to be your Savior, I have to be your Lord as well. You can't have one without the other. Above everything else, I want an intimate relationship with you. I want to spend time with you. I want to know you. I want you to know me. Without that, there's nothing. Man, Jesus, it was so much easier when you were teaching us how to pray and how to give, and those are things that we could easily do, but now you're saying that all of that stuff, if it's not done right, doesn't matter. If it's not motivated by a love for Jesus, it means nothing. Final point, the finality of deception unmasked too late. Verse 23 is so hard to read. Are there any more awful words than the words of Jesus in verse 23? Depart from me. Depart from me. Where else can you go? Where else can you be? To leave the presence of Jesus, to hear the one who died for your sins, to say, I never knew you. Depart from me. And to be banished into utter darkness forever. I can't find a more awful verse in all of Scripture. And that should bring chills to our bones about our relationship with Jesus. See, there are no second chances after that. There's not another opportunity that's given to you when, that's, when he says those words. But Jesus isn't saying, you, saying those things to you at the final judgment. Today, he's speaking those words to you while you still have a chance to come clean, to put all of your lies aside and to come to him. Yes, the creativity of deception is inexhaustible, but the grace and truth of God is infinitely greater. So you can deceive yourself, but you cannot deceive God. And because he knew that you cannot deceive him, he sent his one and only son to take the penalty of your sins, to die in your place so that this morning you can sit here forgiven, cleansed. So that this morning the Holy Spirit can remind you of the self-deception, of the lies that you were feeding yourself. And you can repent and confess and ask him to help you. See, there's no greater example that God loves you than this table that we're about to celebrate. In a few moments, the worship team is going to come, and they're going to be singing. I'm going to invite you to take a moment this morning. You don't have to rush up here, but will you just spend some time with God this morning? Would you examine your heart? Would you examine, would you let the Holy Spirit bring to light the lies that you are telling to yourself about yourself? 
Let me say this. If you're sitting here this morning and you're saying, I'm going to go to heaven because I'm a good person, that's a lie that the enemy is feeding you. What can wash away my sins? What can make me whole again? It isn't my righteousness. It isn't my good works. It isn't my good living. It is the precious blood of Jesus. So if your argument this morning is that you know that Jesus is God, and if your argument this morning is that you know that you speak the truth of the gospel, or if your argument this morning is that you do miracles and signs and wonders in the name of Jesus, Jesus is telling you this morning that's not enough. That's not enough. Do you know me? Are you intimate with me? Do I know you? See, the promise of Scripture is that those he has chosen, he knows. So if you're a child of God this morning, he knows you before you knew him, and he loves you. This morning, if you are not a follower of Jesus, let me invite you to repent, to confess, to ask God to change your life. In a few moments, the team is going to be singing, and I'm going to get off the stage, and you guys are welcome to come and grab the elements. But don't do that without reflecting this morning. Don't do that simply because that's just the next part of service. Take some time. Meditate on these words. Let the Holy Spirit convict you of areas in your life where you need conviction. And then whenever you're ready, you are welcome to come and grab the elements, and we'll partake of communion together. But spend some time with Jesus. Let's worship.